in just a few moments. I'm going to begin with a few announcements this morning. I want to remind everyone about our baptism service that's going to be at uh, 6 p.m. this evening. Uh, I think we have 12 folks that are being baptized out at the lake. Uh, we're going to meet at Camp Car Lake at 6 o'clock. That's out on Flemingtown Road, and that's where our baptism service will be this evening. So uh, we want to rejoice alongside those who are being baptized uh, tonight, but also uh, it's good for us to witness baptism. It's a reminder from the Lord uh, for the promises that he has for all of his baptized children. So uh, let's make plans to be there at 6 p.m. tonight uh, for that baptism service. Also, I want to remind all the parents that Awana will be kicking off this Wednesday night, uh, August the 7th. So that is for preschool age up through the fifth grade. Uh, if you have not signed your child up for Awana, that's not a big deal. Um, you can sign them up uh, when you arrive on Wednesday night. Uh, we'll get that started at 6.15, is that right? 6.15 on Wednesday night. Uh, and so that will go through November. Uh, so we will be meeting consistently every Wednesday night from this Wednesday through November. And lastly, uh, we are going to be having a church-wide prayer walk uh, this Saturday morning, August the 10th at 8.30. We're going to meet here at the church. This is for, for all ages, so bring your whole family. Um, this is a time where we're going to pray for uh, the life of our church uh, at 8.30 on this Saturday morning. If you'll stand with me, we're going to begin our worship uh, by reading the Apostles' Creed together. And um, the, I think the screen back there is... is uh, is broken, so we're going to have to just use the two up front, but we're going to confess the creed together, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Father, what a comfort it is uh, this morning for us to uh, be reminded that there are brothers and sisters all across the globe this morning who are confessing uh, these, same, these same truths. Lord, for thousands of years, uh, there have been believers all across the world. Uh, who have confessed these same truths. So, Lord, we, we thank you that you are still saving sinners today. You are still growing your church. I'm here in Henderson and all across the United States and all across the world that you are calling sinners into your family. And, Lord, we rejoice over the, the number of baptisms that we will celebrate tonight that signify um, their entrance uh, into your family. Lord, I pray for this congregation, uh, for... Uh, each and every day um, that we gather as a church, I pray that um, we would glorify you uh, through our worship. Lord, I pray that your hand would remain on us, that um, as we make every decision as a church, as we um, live our lives among one another as this congregation, as we go out into our community, that we would be uh, people who are marked by love, that people would look at us and know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ by the way that we love. 
Lord, I pray that we would hold steadfast to sound doctrine. And Lord, that we would uh, continue to preach the word regularly here at Harriet Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that you would anoint Will for that task this morning. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. my 
salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. You're my stronghold and my shield in the midst of every threat. Though the wicked never yield, they will vanish like This is love I can't explain. This is mercy unreserved. Through your sacrifice so great, I have peace that's undeserved. For the battle has been won, and I fear no shame or loss. Now the sting of death is gone. You're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken. My soul will wait, my soul will wait for you. You're my comfort when I feel forsaken, my refuge and my sure foundation, my soul. Till 
Well, good morning, church. Well, it's good to see everybody here today. If you would, uh, go ahead and take your copy of God's Holy Word and turn me to the book of Daniel. We're going to pick up while we left off last week in chapter 2, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Uh, before we do that, I kind of want to give you a recap and, and kind of give you an introduction leading into the, the verses that we're going to be looking at today. You know that Daniel uh, chapter 1 through 6 is mainly about Daniel and his three Hebrew friends. King Nebuchadnezzar, he has in, invaded Judea and he has brought back with him many exiles, brought them back to Babylon. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, he brings these young boys into his kingdom. Uh, he gives them uh, new names and he wants them to live for his kingdom, to live for his name, and to do his will. And Jesus taught us to pray for God's kingdom to come, God's name to be honored, and God's will to be done. And right now, in every moment since the tragedy that took place in the Garden of Eden, there's been two kingdoms that have been clashing the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of this world. Uh, the kingdoms of this world, they, they come in many variations, but they all share one thing in common. They are opposed to God and to the truth of Scripture. Now, uh, a lot of this book is, is about how to live as servants of God in a place where God is not respected. In a culture where everyone around you lives by a different set of standards and values, uh, there's people that if you follow Jesus, they're not just going to see, see you as an odd person. There's going to be people who won't like you uh, because of your core beliefs and the truths that you stand on. So this book is about how not just survive in that type of environment, because let's be honest, this is the culture, this is the environment that we are now living in in the United States of America. And so we don't want to just survive, we want to be a witness. This book's about how to let your light shine in darkness. And if there's ever been a time in my life that the church needs to let its light shine, it is now. Now, instead of letting our light shine, many times Christians will either choose assimilation or separation. Assimilation means that you start to get conformed to the standards of this world. You gradually, uh, even though you profess Jesus Christ, you, you start to look like everyone else in your culture. Your lifestyle, it imitates the laws, uh, your, the things that you talk about, uh, your value starts to uh, become uh, their values and, and your lifestyle imitate theirs. Uh, that's not what the church is supposed to do. Or sometimes that's what we call separation, which is the opposite. You, you see everything in the world as evil, so you want to come out from among them and you isolate, you separ separate yourself from the differences in the worlds and their worldviews. Uh, an example of this could be the Amish people. Uh, they kind of just isolate themselves. But we should be like Daniel. God hasn't called us to assimilation or separation. He has called the church to be a transformation. Daniel and his friends, they take on Babylonian names. They speak the Babylonian language. They work in a pagan Babylonian palace. But they do so as faithful servants of God. They let their light shine. God's will for the Israelite exiles at this moment was not to stay separated from the culture in Babylon, but to influence the culture around them. You're either going to influence the culture around you, or you're going to assimilate and look like the culture around you. Matter of fact, uh, Jeremiah was the prophet at this time, and, and he wrote to the exiles in Babylon in Jeremiah 29, verses 4 to 7, 
And this is what the Lord of hosts says in verse 7. This is the word of God for the people of Israel. He said, To all who are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. God is a sovereign God. He allowed this to happen. He said, Build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit, take wives, beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to, uh, to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you uh, may be increased there and not dis diminished. And seek the peace of that city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And you pray for that city. You pray for that culture. For in its peace you will have peace. As we do life, we need to be like Daniel. We need to seek the well-being of our city, our nation. We need to be praying for that. And with that in mind, or if you're able, let's stand for the reading of our text this morning. Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So he, he assembled uh, most of his wise men. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have a dream. And in my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. The king answered, and he said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut into pieces, and your houses should be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and you will, we will give you his interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you will gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till this time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation." And these Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason the king was angry, and very furious, and gave a command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Will you pray with me? Father God, as we uh, continue to worship, uh, Lord, I just pray in a, in a very powerful way uh, that your word will speak and penetrate, uh, open our eyes, and uh, Lord, I, I just ask that you will uh, just richly bless our time spent in this text. Speak, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. So after King Nebuchadnezzar uh, woke from his dream, he, uh, he couldn't go back to sleep. He had so much anxiety and, and worry that he summoned most of his wise men, the, the sorcerers and magicians and enchanters and astrologers, 
And he told them, he summoned them and said, I, I need your services. And, and they responded like they have time and time before. They said, O oh, king, live forever. How can I help you? He, uh, he says, I need you to uh, interpret my dream. And they're like, no problem, man. You, you tell me the dream, and we will get together, and we will let you know the meaning. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar, he... Uh, he, he introduced an extraordinary complication. I would like to say uh, he threw them a curveball. <laughs> they, they weren't expecting this. He says, and instead of telling the Babylonian his dream, which they, would, they had these books that they would reference to, a dream interpretation and other resources, he declared that they would have to find out the dream itself and the interpretation. Very simply, if they succeeded, great riches and great honor. However, if they fail to interpret the dream, they had to tell him what he dreamed and then the interpretation. If they could not do that, uh, it would be a slow, painful death. He would start with the fingers and start cutting them up piece by piece until they died. And if that wasn't bad enough, he was going to go and destroy their homes and burn them to the ground. I know sometimes uh, Sunday night, people get what they call the Monday morning blues already. They, they, they get to thinking about everything they got to do at work the next day, and, and they start to get sad. All I got to say, uh, if y'all think y'all have a tough boss, just be glad King Nebuchadnezzar ain't your boss. If you mess up, <laughs> that's it. I mean, this, this is serious. It, and the wise men, they're like, man, we can't believe that you're asking us to do the impossible. That's why they say in verse 11, it is a difficult thing that the king requests. And there's no other who can tell the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. The, these wise men, they knew that they were powerless to fulfill the king's demands. Uh, they confess their inability, and they tell King Nebuchadnezzar, the only one who could help him, the only one with power to give him what he wants, is a god. But they say gods don't dwell with mortals. They, in their despair, are basically saying, can you imagine that a god would come to earth and dwell with us mortals? What Jesus Christ did on the first Christmas morning is completely inconceivable to these Babylonian wise men. Not only did God come to earth, that was a God who was willing to die for you so that you could have eternal life. Well, let me tell you what happened a few hundred years later. Out of the east, these Babylonian wise men, they made a journey to Bethlehem. And in their hands, they brought great treasures of frankincense, mirth, and gold. They came hundreds of years later to worship the God who came to earth. Now, back to our text. The king, he did not like that response. He went from mad to it's about to be a bad day. In verses 12 to 13, for this king, reason, the king was very angry, very furious, and he gave a command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men. You, you know those guys that just said, we can't interpret your dream? They never made it out of the king's palace. I don't know about you, but if they would have got me, they'd have got me with a spear in my back because I'd have looked like I was running for the gold medal in the 100-yard dash. <laughs> I'd have been out of there. And then he was so angry, he says, I'm going to take out 
all of my wise men. Do you know who was also a wise man? Daniel and his companions. He set out to kill them. When the bad news came to Daniel, he responded with a wisdom and faith in God that is beyond his years. He, he didn't start walking around being rude. He didn't have a picket sign. Well, with a humble and gentle spirit, God used him in a powerful way. And that same gentle and humble spirit is the same way that God would use his people to make a difference in this pagan nation. And in Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 14, it says, Then with the counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who has gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. You don't want to hear nobody knocking at your door and you open up the door and there goes area <laughs> standing on your steps. That, that is usually not a good day for you. He, he was the main hit man for the king. And he answered to area the king's captain, and says, Why is this decree from the king so urgent? Then area made decision known to Daniel. In verse 16, so Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made decision known to Hananiah, Mashiel, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So apparently from my text, Daniel and his companions, we know that they were not among the others who failed uh, Nebuchadnezzar's request. Still, they are guilty by association. Y'all ever heard that before? Be careful who you associate with. It can make a difference. It can ruin your life. My mom always told me, I said it last week, people to hang together... Smell together. Birds of the same feather, they do what? Flock. Y'all heard that too? Be careful who you associate with. Arioch, the head of Nebuchadnezzar's execution squad, came looking for Daniel and his friends. He was literally about to rip them to pieces. But God gave Daniel favor your mama Aspenaz, the, the chief of the eunuchs, um, God gave him favor with him. God also gave him favor with Arioch. Daniel responds with politeness, tact, and discretion to the captain of the king's guard who was there to lead them to their execution. He wisely and respectfully raised the question, why is this uh, so urgent decree from the king to commit mass murder on his major advisors? Ariot tells him why, and Daniel responds with an incredible act of courage and faith. He goes into the king's throne room and asks for time, the very thing that Nebuchadnezzar just executed the other wise men for. Trusting in God, Daniel promises to return and give the king the interpretation. Daniel is, let me remind you, is probably 17, 18 at the most at this time. He's exiled, he's a conquered slave, a man that is now marked for death, but he still stays calm, poised, and fully capable of speaking the truth to the most powerful king in the universe at this time. Daniel understood that in spite of the chaos of the situation that this event too was under the sovereignty, under the control of a holy God who had a purpose in all of us. Sometimes we go through life and it can get uh, extreme chaotic. We may not understand everything. Sometimes we can look back after a few years and we can see God's purpose and the plan on why we were going through. And that's going to be things in life that you will never ever have the question of why fully settled on this side of heaven. But this purpose, we know, was to not simply show Nebuchadnezzar the future through his dream that we're going to look at next week, 
but to demonstrate clearly the difference between Daniel and the rest of the wise men. But most importantly, the difference between Daniel's God and their false God. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 to 18, it says, Daniel went to his house, made decision known to Hananiah, Mashiel, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Daniel did not say, man, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to go try to find that, that book of dream interpretation that these other guys have, and I'm just going to open the book up in the middle and put my finger down on it and just hope that's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. He didn't say, you know what? I, I think I better call Dr. Phil on this. Maybe, maybe Dr. Phil can tell me what I should do next. Do you know what Daniel did? He called the very first prayer meeting that I can find recorded in Scripture. He made a meeting to consult the Most High God of the universe. Daniel didn't even know Matthew 7, verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you concerning God's will. I can't help but to wonder what would have happened if Daniel would have went to God in prayer. Praying together is a powerful and seldom practice in many churches in America. You, you, you want to know what the least attended service here at Harriet is? Is our monthly prayer meeting. We can have 200 and 50 people on any given Sunday and have 20 when we're praying for our nation, praying for those that are lost and God's will be done in this community. You know, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, it says that Daniel was granted a, a special talent, a, a gift of understanding of all kinds of visions and dreams. And yet, even with this gift, he still makes the wise choice to humble himself before the giver of every good thing that's bestowed in every perfect gift. He uh, humbled himself and sought the hand of God. It, this, this is important. I mean, the, the, the first thing he did was pray. I, I want to remind you, this is, we, we, we don't usually make that our first thing sometimes. We wait a lot of times till it's our last resort. Prayer should be our first line of defense. And again, it's amazing. The, these young teenagers, they, they're young men living in a foreign culture, a foreign language. They've been stripped from everything familiar but they rely on a holy God. In their teen years, they are saying that we first got to see the face of God. Everything we do should be preceded by and permeated with prayer. Without prayer, we will have no power in the ministry. Our serving and our singing will be lifeless and fruitless. Our preaching and teaching will be ineffective. Our witness and our work will be null and void. Our meetings will be boring. Many years ago, five young college students had made about a five-hour journey to London to hear Charles Haddon Spurgeon preach. I mean, it was such an anointing on Spurgeon's ministry that if you even wanted to get a seat in that huge tabernacle, you, you would have to get there a good hour before the service started, and, and it would be a line waiting to get in. And they didn't want to miss out. This was that one chance. They journeyed a long ways. They got there two hours early. It was cold that morning. They was the first ones on the steps. They were out there shaking, and all of a sudden the door opened up. And this man looked at them and said, I, I know y'all are cold. Would y'all like to see the heating apparatus of this church? 
And they's like, well, that ain't what we came for, but man, anything that we can do to get warm, we'll go look at it. So take us on down. Let's go look at the heating apparatus. And, and they walked into the church. The big sanctuary was over here. And there was these steps that went downstairs. And they walked down the steps. And they walked out into this large room. And when they got there, there was over 700 people on their knees praying before a holy God that God would move in that city, move in that church, and bring men and women to saving faith. And that man who was no other than Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he looked at those young men and he said, don't y'all ever forget this. That's the heating apparatus of this church. And if this church is going to be what all it can be, it's going to need the same type of heating apparatus. It's going to start and continue by us humbling ourselves and trusting Him in prayer. The book of Acts, we, we, we see the saints praying together, lifting our voices up to God in and, and one accord. They've been arrested, uh, they've been beating, and they've been told that they couldn't mention or preach in the name of Jesus anymore. So what do they do? They get together and they say, we need to pray about this. In Acts chapter 4, verse 24, when they heard that, uh, they, they raised their voices to God with one accord. They said, Lord, you are God who made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them. Now, Lord, look on that threats. Grant to your servants that with all boldness we'll be able to speak your word. And when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken, and they were filled, they were anointed with the Holy Spirit, and they went out and spoke the word of God with authority and power. It started with prayer. In our text this morning, God answers the, the Hebrews prayer, uh, they were in one accord and he revealed to Daniel God's plan for the ages. Uh, he gives them an outline through Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the history of the world. Little one that Daniel was filled with all for the God of heaven who revealed his plan on earth to his humble servant that was in exile. Daniel was dependent on the Lord Jesus and we must be Two. See, we live in America. That, that's a great temptation that, that uh, we can take care of ourselves. We got everything we need. We, we may have experienced even financial success, but let, let me tell you, we don't have it together. If you want God's blessing, you have to be dependent on Him. Prayer acknowledges our dependence and need for a holy God. I, I've never met a believer that would not tell me that prayer is not important. Never met one. But there's a difference between believing that prayer is important and believing that prayer is essential. Essential means that there are things that will not happen without prayer. God responded to that prayer. In verse 19 of Daniel chapter 2, Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. In verses 20 to 23, Daniel takes the time to praise God. He is not ungrateful. He is so thankful that, that God answered their prayers. He said in verse 20 of chapter 2, Blessed be the name of of God forever and ever, from whom wisdom and might are His, and He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with Him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You, might, uh, you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to us what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. If we want to change this nation, if you're putting all your hope in this upcoming election, you are missing the point. God is sovereign over whoever he uh, puts in office there. 
He, he is looking more than a vote from you. He's looking for people that would get on their knees and pray for God to move in this nation. And I want to tell you something. If we're going to build that new sanctuary out here, it's going to be God doing that. It's going to be God answering our prayers. We're putting together a prayer walk this weekend, this Saturday, and then in a few weeks, uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. the next day, we think we're going to do it on Mondays. If you're able, we're going to ask you to fast and to pray. We're going to be praying for unity in this church. If you don't have unity in the church, you don't have nothing. We're going to be praying that through this process at this church we're going to stay unified. We're going to be praying on God's time and the worst thing we can do is get out ahead of God. We're going to be praying that God's uh, way is, is how we're going to do things and we're also going to be praying for His provisions. I'm praying that by August of next year we're going to break ground. But I'm also praying that, that he'll confirm that and that he'll provide every single penny that we need. If we think that we're going to do this on our own, we're going, we're going to mess it up. We're going to turn this over to God and give it to him. Will you pray with me? Father God, just... Uh, Thank you for giving us a great opportunity like Daniel to be in darkness all around this community. We're all going to go to different places this week. We're going to interact with different people. But God, it's my prayer that all of us, that we want to transform this community, this nation, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that all of us will let our light shine brightly. Lord, in just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to worship you again and give you the praise that you deserve as a church family. But Lord, as we're doing that, let's also just make this a, a time of prayer. Lord, I, I pray that we'll pray for our nation. Uh, we may feel like uh, we're Daniel just living in a, in a pagan government, a pagan society. But Daniel had a, such an impact. Uh, God, help us have that same kind spirit that the Holy Spirit gives us to make a difference, to change, to draw people to the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray that uh, we'll be praying for those who are near and dear to us, but, but far from you, that we'll be coming to you, praying for that salvation. Lord, I pray that there may be some that, that are already uh, praying for your plans here uh, on this campus. And so, Lord, we lift that up to you. And, Lord, I pray, and it's my heart's desire, that you're at work in someone's life, maybe someone that's in here this morning, that is lost, or maybe someone who is on the fence, God, I'm asking that you would save that person right now. That right now at this moment can be a moment of salvation, the day of salvation, and that they would just surrender, confess you as Lord, and ask for forgiveness, and that you would save them right now. Lord, we love you, and as we stand to sing, the altar is open. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, on Wednesday night, uh, we're kicking our wellness program uh, back off. We're, we're going to have uh, hot dogs and uh, some snacks, and that's going to be a bounce house and uh, a slide. So we, we're going to have a good time as we get that started. Uh, youth will be starting back up uh, on Wednesday night. And we're just a few weeks away from having the uh, modular finished so that we can start back our adult uh, Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, so hopefully uh, in the next two or three weeks we can uh, have that ready to go. Also, uh, we're, we're just uh, trusting in the Lord that we won't have storms like we did uh, last night. Uh, if it's thundering real bad, uh, Brandon will be doing the baptisms. <laughs> 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 on pull some rain cone. <laughs> and uh but if it's nice i'm just joking about that uh we, we we're planning on doing we got uh, a lot of homemade ice cream i think right now we have 13 people uh that's going through uh, believers baptism um and if you uh someone that, that wants to get baptized uh, because you haven't been obedient or just recently been saved you can't come up to me uh, three seconds before we're about to start the service and say, I want to get baptized. So uh, you got between now and uh, about four o'clock to, uh, to give me a call or, or, or talk to me. So uh, I hope everybody uh, in the church will want to come out and, and to celebrate. Uh, we're, we're very thankful. So before I start boohooing, let me, let me dismiss us in prayer. Lord, just uh, thank you for our church family. Just thank you, Father God, for uh, what you're doing here, uh, your hand on this ministry. And Lord, we acknowledge that every good thing that's being done is, is, is because of what you're doing. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We ask that you continue to uh, put your hand upon this body. Uh, help us make a difference in your kingdom. Uh, help us when we leave to let our light shine. In Jesus' name, amen.